Can you all hear me? Who's on their phones instead of listening to me? I'm the only speaker today that's going to congratulate you for that sort of behaviour because that's exactly what we're going to talk about today is people doing such things. We are in a mobile phone obsessed world, I think you'll agree, yes? How obsessed and how fast has this come on? Well, I was looking back through some old talks I gave a while ago and I realised that this was a quote uh, that I heard from Telstra in 2010 and it was at a conference where they got up and spoke about this and they said 30% of people are already on smartphones and it'll be 50% within like six months to nine months, they were saying. And you could see everybody in the room sort of go, mm, don't really agree with that prediction. That sounds a little bit too fast. Um, and they were, that's, they were actually surprised that it was that big and there were actually that many people. Yet if I look at these figures, the most recent you could get your hands on from 2017, it's 80%, you see the blue on the top line, 80% of people now have a smartphone or on a smartphone, which doesn't sound like too much until you realise that about 13% of the population is under 10 years old, about 1% is over 90 and about 1% lives in no mobile coverage areas. See the Telstra ad where we cover 99% of the population. And suddenly you see that's pretty much everybody is doing that. The other 5% is my uncle who says that all he wants is a phone that bounces, so he just has a, like a little Nokia that's covered in rubber basically, <laughs> and he's an engineer, and he, he actually will bounce his phone for you to prove that he can bounce his phone, but there are not many of those people out there. Most of us are on our mobile. Are on our mobile. Worldwide, of course, Australia will ultimately follow trends, and this may well be the trend here. Um, we have a winner. Somewhere at the end of last year, you'll find that internet access was overtaken on mobile devices than it was on desktop devices. Um, you'll also find that all the predictions that other, as other countries come up through the world, they're going straight to mobile. They're not going via desktop. In fact, I saw a very interesting statistic the other day. We were working on, of all things, sanitation and um, children having access to toilets in second and third world countries. And the statistic was that more um, people have access to mobile phones in those countries than they do toilets. So that's how ubiquitous the phone has become to people's lives. Easier to be on the phone than be on the toilet and hey, they do go together for some people too. Um, meanwhile in Australia, the most recent um, stats I can get you on this is 2015, so this would have moved on and these are essentially cumulative figures that say to you, 29% um, of people don't have a landline anymore, so they're only accessing telephones via mobiles. The middle one is saying that 21% are only accessing the internet by phones. And if you were to get a giant Venn diagram of those two sets, the middle bit would be the 12% that says 12% of Australians, adult Australians, are only accessing both phone and internet via mobiles. And that's 2015, as I say. So have a look at that figure. That other one was from 2010. We're in 2018, um, getting towards 2019. That would be higher in these days. So you're starting to see it be really a driving force through how people deal with things. It's not a phone, let's be honest with it. Even that, as a name, is, is kind of untrue. It's a mobile computer. That's what it is. It's a computer in your pocket. So even thinking of it as a phone, I think, is wrong. Um, what are we doing on it? We are doing everything, unsurprisingly. We are communicating. Uh, we are banking. We are doing research and finding other information. We're watching Netflix, Stan Fox, or YouTube, whatever we want in our entertainment activities. We are buying and selling stuff. We're browsing, and I love that old word, surfing. Who remembers that from the days of the internet? Surfing, looking for something to find on the internet. Just literally going, what can I find? And we're social networking, which actually surprised me as being one of the lowest things that we do on it, even though obviously there's a lot of it goes on. That's not time done, that's the amount of people doing it. So maybe if you were to change that time on, it might change a bit. Uh, where are we doing it? We're doing it everywhere. You know, marketers are running like ads on public transport. Yeah, maybe, maybe there's a problem with that. Um, we're doing it while we're waiting for the bus. So there's nice big glossy ad shells. Who's looking at them? That's okay, I can put a billboard up, right, and get you as you walk down the street. Yeah, no. There's actually, you'll see it being trialled in Sydney. It came from, um, I believe, uh, the Netherlands, where they've got the problem with the silent trams. But actually, instead of having the, the walk, don't walk signs up on, the, on, the, on the, um, the pole, as you usually do, it's actually being embedded as red and green lights in the footpath, just because we're walking around their phones. I actually read a funny thing on The Onion once that said, new app developed, stop uh, smartphone users walking into each other. 
which is a joke, but it wouldn't be a bad idea. Beep, beep, beep. Oops, sorry, mate. But that's all right. Those who are still buying by getting in line instead of online, maybe those people we can catch them at point of sale. Nope, that's not happening anymore either. Can't get you there if I'm marketing to you. Uh, pester power has always been the great one, right? Get the kids to demand off their parents. Sorry, mum's not listening. And nor's dad. Even when we're on a date, what are we doing? We're looking for a new date. When we're watching TV, we're not watching TV, we're watching what's being called the second screen. We're actually playing with our phones. I don't know about you, I'm shocking at this. I come from a generation where this didn't happen. I used to watch a whole movie and then another movie. Now I have to stop my movie three times to fiddle around my phone. I watch in three pieces now. It's just how our brains have become trained for this stuff, you know? We're doing it while we're driving. <laughs> Which, of course, there should be laws against this, right? Unfortunately, this is what the lawmakers are all up to when they're meant to be making the laws. It's a real photo from the UK. I'm sure it's exactly the same. I'm sure it's actually worse here right now, of course, because they're all sitting there watching the news headlines. Yeah? And they're not even in Parliament anymore as of today. So anyway, it's everybody. You know, this whole thing of kids and their phones is just a load of rubbish. Sitting, you want to see people on their phones, watch parents in a playground sitting around. They're all on their phones. It's every generation. It crosses every single boundary. Um, and it even gets to the point where the first thing people do, we do in the morning is get on our phones. And the last thing we do at night is get on our phones, you know? So if we're in marketing, we need to be where the action is at because it's not in that photo, yeah? <laughs> so how are we going to do it? This is where things have sort of gone. This is one of my favourite websites, the Bondo Beach Surf Report. And this is kind of what it looks like when you scroll through it. You get a big ad, then you get the little version of the ad, and then as you scroll, of course, the little version of the ad goes to the bottom, then I get to my cam feed and up comes a video ad. And like at some point, I get through all the ads and I get the content I wanted, yeah? And I sort of look at this and I go, really? Really, really, really? Is this the best that we can do? Just take the, this idea of display ads and just stuff it onto a phone? I'm not saying there's no role for this, but this, this is your version of mobile marketing. I think there's a smarter way to do things, yeah? And you start to say, why get in the way of the content when you can actually be the content? And of course, this is content marketing, and this is where you get smarter about these things. So I've got a challenge for you. And this is the challenge. This is the home screen of my phone. You can see what goes on on my phone and in my life. I've got a challenge, there's about 100 apps on my phone, roughly, of which I probably use 10 on a regular basis, 20 on a semi-regular basis. We'd all be about the same. We may have less apps depending on how big your storage is, all that sort of thing. But here's the challenge. Next time you put up a marketing campaign, go, how many of these apps can I involve in my campaign? Because when you start to think like this, you start to think mobile first. I'm going to show you one campaign we've done that I think does a reasonably good job of it, and at least gives you a start as to how to think about these things. Um, it's called Plant Life Balance, and it was released in about October last year, so it's coming towards a year old. It's about nine months old. The idea is designed around, well, it sort of does what it says on the tin. Put more plants in your life and you get a better balance in your life, mental balance, these things. And the brief is quite simply, it comes through the nursery industry, sell us more, some more plants. The angle that was identified in all the strategy and the research was, was well-being. The thing that's driving this is this interest towards well, a well-being, a more happy life. We're starting to live busier lives in a concrete jungle. This is not necessarily how we want to be. We've got less time on our hands and we've kind of got less nature in our lives. So how can we bring this back into it? And this is the sort of thinking that drives this campaign. Um, any campaign we do, I always start with this. What's the news? There's a great saying somebody said once, uh, Jess Miller, in fact, who's now the Deputy Lord Mayor of Sydney, who actually works with us. Um, she said, why would I care and why would I share? And it's the best way to start any campaign, because if you can start with that, why would I care, why would I share? You know when the people put things on the table and go, oh, and people will share it? And you go, would you share it? Well, no. <laughs> why would they share it? Why would I care? Why would I share? What can you put on the table that I personally would get involved in? Because if you can answer that message, you haven't just answered the social media question of shareability, you've actually answered the question of can we find something that's actually newsworthy here. People think it's really hard to get the news. It's actually not that hard. You have all these publications that are trying to fill up these spaces every single day, but they don't want your ad. They don't want your self-serving stuff. They want new news. The, the name is the giveaway. It's the news, right? Give them something new and something that the readers will appreciate. And as soon as you start to think like this, you start to see how, what can lead a campaign. That's, of course, the icon for the news app, but for most people it's uh, Chrome or Google. But how can we just start by that, that browser you use every day? How can I get into your life through that? 
Here's what we did. When we first started um, this, everyone said health and well-being, and I said back to them, well, why are these, why are plants good for you? Why are they healthy? And everyone said, well, there's heaps of research on it. I said, yeah, what does the research say? And they said that they make you healthier. I went, yeah, cool. Like, what are they, how? Well, read the research. I'm like, I'm not reading the research. Like, how much research is there? Oh, hundreds of papers. I said, I think we've got a problem and an opportunity here. If you can't tell me one stat on how plants can improve my life, how are we meant to market them? So we took this, and one of the great ways, of course, of getting media is to do some sort of research study. So we took this uh, to RMIT University, and I said, hey, we don't want to read all this. Can you read all this? Which is called a literature review. And then bring back something that is easy to explain to your average person on this. And here's what they said. On a medium-sized room, so a medium-sized room would be um, about two-thirds of this stage, just roughly, so about 20 square metres. About 10 square metres would be about here, just for your ideas. So, um, and they said one medium plant in a medium-sized room will improve your air quality by 25%. They said, you stick five plants in and that goes up to more like 60%, you'd stick 10 plants in and you've maximised the air quality in that room. You've taken out the particulates, the what's called volatile organic compounds, things like benzene that come off your carpets and your furniture finishings, those sorts of things. They said, but here's what's really interesting. That's obvious, everyone kind of knows that, I'm just putting numbers on it. They said, the other bit that people don't know is about well-being. We're all still monkeys in a jungle and we live in this concrete jungle. And they said, if you just, and what we want is that feeling of being back in the jungle again. And when we have that feeling, we suddenly get this idea that we can take on the day. We get these feelings that all those pressures are okay when we're around plants. And they said, just putting one plant in that space is going to do nothing. You don't get that feeling from that. But once you put five plants in, you get 60% better mental well-being, focus these things. And again, 10 will maximize it out. And we looked at that and we said, gee, that's pretty interesting. Because that's not just science that sails. You stick one plant in your room, I can improve your air quality 25%. You stick three in, I'll start making you feel better about your day and more able to take on the day. However, you stick 10 in, and you're going to get maximum health and well-being out of your life, out of your room. And you go, this is, and they literally compressed hundreds of surveys, uh, hundreds of studies into these simple facts. Of course, which we turn around and go, great, you've given me the science, I can give you, well, I, sorry, I can give you back the marketing, which is something like that. I can improve your air quality 25%. That's a plant tag from the campaign. Where does this go? Um, science alone is not great news, it's a little bit quick. You need to add some element of visioning to it, something that brings it to life for people. Um, we live in an Instagram world, so you start to look at fashion as a driver of health and well-being. So what we did then is we worked with a plant stylist and said, design us some looks that match these criteria for different audiences, because I want to look for me. I just don't want just plants, I want something for me. So you live in a share house, these are uh, easy to move around and hard to kill. You live in a, uh, you want to eat things, you're sick of paying $3 for your herbs down at the supermarket. I don't pay $3 for basil every time I want bruschetta. Okay, no worries, Fantastic Feast is the sort of look for you. You can eat this stuff. Desert Dreams is your succulents for your hot places, less watering. Child's Plays, I don't want my kids to eat them and um, suddenly feel sick, or my animals for that matter. Uh, birds and the bees is I want native animals to come in my garden. Bees and birds, those sorts of things. Jungle Vibes is I want to look like I live in Instagram which is that rich thing you start to see and it's coming up over and over again. Once we've got this sort of content, you can see we've got exactly what we need for a media campaign because I've got something that looks good and I've got some science to back it. And I'm not going out there to the news media saying, could you please promote our product? I'm going out there saying, we've got some new news that might be interested to your readers. Did you know? And suddenly you're in places like this. You're in um, the hack, Triple J, how indoor plants boost air quality and mental wellbeing. In the Herald Sun, plants make you happier, healthier, and more of your um, specialist media, like the plant hunter, max out your plant life balance, that sort of thing. And they're just three examples of hundreds of media that start to talk about this. So suddenly I've entered your phone via the browser, and that's our first place. When you have science like this, though, too, you also have a bigger opportunity to start to create a packaged, uh, use the science, put the science into action yourself in your home. Um, so let's tick off news media. Uh, so what about an app? We designed an app that goes something like this.
online ad for it. I'll take you through it a little bit, uh, a little bit more thoroughly now. Um, I can do two things with this app. I can style my space. I can rate my space. If I want to rate my space, I say, how big is the space? Tell me the size of it. Um, of course, there's some pictures to help you out, because nobody knows what three by three looks like unless you kind of do a lot of renovations. I tell it how many um, plants I have in my space. Um, I, it then gives me a rating. Great, you're doing like this. Your plant life balance is pretty good based on what you've got in your space. Of course, if you want to improve it, you can add new plants, bottom right, and we go through the other side of the app where I choose the look that I want. I can swipe through. I go, I want to look like Instagram. Uh, I then go in and I take a photo. This is my local cafe. So I can photograph any room. I could photograph this room. And then I can grab plants from that look and I can drag them into that space. So it's augmented reality. I can then uh, choose light levels, all those sorts of things. As you can see, I can move the plants around. I can pinch them and make them bigger and smaller. I can shift them to the back. I can shift them to the front. And when I've had enough, I can click the I'm done button on the bottom right and it will tell me what I've done with my space. Your space is doing really well. It's right fantastically. Would you like this emailed to you? I can save the photo down to my photos or I can have the plant list emailed to me. It tells me where to send it and I can collect your name on a database, which means we can keep talking at a later date. If you do it well and you think it through, uh, apps do very, very well. In our experience, it's got a 4.9 star rating, it's got 55,000 downloads, and Bunning, Bunnings picked it up, put it on 9,000 of their little iPods that they have in store because they thought it was useful. It's got some really nice comments like, um, um, thank you, my house is on the journey to becoming full jungle, and people starting to send us through the looks that they've created. So people start to feed it back to you. Suddenly you've created something that's interactive, not just you marketing at them, because you've given them a tool. Instead of selling you plants, I've given you something to play with. My nine-year-old girl actually um, says to me, hey, Dada, can I play the plant game? And as soon as she said that, I knew we'd won, because when a kid sees this as a toy, it's fun. I'm not selling you anything, I'm giving you some fun. That gives you, in turn, more news media, but in different news. Mashable, picking it up. Everyone wants to be in Mashable. They've got great readership, you know, which showing and showing and people running that little video that show you how it's done. When you start to wrap that up, um, you, you have the opportunity to then pitch to bigger media because you've got something they can show and they can play with on TV news media. You've got people like Jamie Jury who will go and front your campaign and put you on um, the Today Show. And suddenly you see, just by thinking in terms of news, toys, fun, I haven't tried to sell you anything at this point. We're all over the news and there's millions of people watching this stuff. What have we done there? Well, we've managed to use the App Store. I started by introducing the news, introducing the news app or the, your browser. Now I've introduced the App Store. We've used your camera to take the photo. We've used your photos to download to. Excuse me, this is all based on iPhone. I know the Android equivalents. Um, I've emailed you the list of plants that you should take into your nursery, as well as the photo of the look you created. And suddenly I'm on your phone in an even bigger way. But let's not stop there. Of course, in this world, we've got to get social too, yeah? What we have here is a content-based campaign. I don't want to just take photos and forget about it. I want to now learn how to uh, spend more time with my plants, how to be better at my plants. So what do we do? You, of course, do the standard things. Pick your channels. We chose Facebook and Instagram because they're the two obvious ones for this. We've managed to build, since October last year, 32,000 people following us on um, Facebook and around t almost tantalizingly close to 10,000 on Instagram. How do we do this? You've just got to post good content. You've got to be consistent. You've got to be regular. You've got to have your content screams. You've got to test, see what works, keep um, feeding, uh, feeding the strong, killing the weak kind of thing. We keep going through and finding out what people want, defining our audience. We find different audiences on Facebook and Instagram too, so we use different content. Trying to post the same thing to both is What's the point? So in Instagram, it's things like this. People want these amazing, rich looks, things that they can copy in their home, obviously. They want interesting science. This is, um, I love this one. It's actually about um, tree canopies and what they call crown shyness. And it's when trees meet in the top of a canopy, sometimes they just don't touch and you get these amazing little lines through there. So there's all these little scientific things you can draw out of your subject matter and little did you knows and little facts. Um, and of course, competitions is another way to engage people. Uh, we ask people, what's your look that you've created? Send it in and we'll give you a voucher to buy more plants. And you go, which seems kind of ironic that people with the best plant looks actually get more plants, but hey, that's the way the world works. So they're probably the ones most interested too. And of course this grows and grows, and what we're finding is that the um, engagement and also the growth of the Instagram channel is going through the roof. And of course when you hit about 10,000 on Instagram, you generally hit another power boost because you become seen as actually a leading feed within that space. So suddenly you kind of break through a lot of the, a lot of the 
I guess clutter is not a nice way to put it, but a lot of the other feeds, and you start to become one of the leading feeds. We also, of course, run some ads, and this is the only ads in the whole campaign. So the only ads we run are just little things, little snippets, little versions of that ad, little did you knows, just to try and get, and what we do, of course, is use matched audiences on Facebook and Instagram and go out there and try and grow our audiences to other people who are like the people who already like us. And that's pretty effective. What does that mean? We've got, suddenly I've got your Instagram app and I've got your Facebook app. I'm in those two now. What about retailers? This is forthcoming. So we're just updating it. It's been a pretty good success. So what we've done is we've taken the science that I explained to you in extremely short detail, and we've turned it into a little video that all the plant retailers can, um, the plant retailers can watch and understand in about 10, 15 minutes. Why? Because I don't want you getting this app, following the feeds, walking into a uh, retail nursery and saying, tell me about plant life balance. And they go, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not a great user journey. That's not a great experience. What I want you to do is walk in and they go, fantastic, show me what you decided at home. Let's talk about the different plants. Look, you use this, but it's probably not right in this climate. Why don't we swap it out with something like this and then get a really customized, curated experience when you're in the nursery. So to do that, we need to train the nursery. So we set up this uh, YouTube video that they can watch, they can understand the science. There's then a, a little um, multiple choice Q&A where they can prove that they understand the science and by doing that they become a plant life balance accredited nursery. If you become that, suddenly you're on our map as a plant life balance accredited nursery. And the next generation of the app will allow you to make your look um, and then say, find me a nursery where I can buy my look, and bang, I'll be able to then get directions. I'll go out of the app, I'll go into Maps or Google Maps, whichever one you use, and I'll be led to the nursery. So you start by photographing your room, and then you're literally in your car or however you get there in your Uber, <laughs> there would be another part of the, your phone, um, going to get these plants. So we bring the whole experience through. Um, when you get there, and this is now gone offline, but we make sure there's some good point of sale materials. We give them packs with all the little science and plant life balance they can put all over the plants. So you, you get the feeling you're in the right place when you get there. It's extension of the experience. And then what's happening is some of the smart nurseries are, are cottoning onto this, the online retailers, and they're boxing up the different looks that we've created, and they're selling them on eBay and on their own platforms. So you can actually then just go, I'd just like to buy that look. So a future generation that may actually let you just get the thing home delivered. We realize there's a bit of fun to be had here where we could do some plant growing music. If you'd like to know the science behind this, we actually looked at it. Um, everyone thinks it's kind words and all those sorts of things, but actually when you stick two plants in a room and you play them all different sorts of music, one type makes them grow faster than any other. Does anyone want to guess what that type is? Classical? Rock? Baroque. Baroque, thank you, that's very classy. Um, anyways, it's actually heavy metal. Plants love heavy metal. <laughs> and the theory behind it is that it's not the music at all, it's the vibrations. And heavy metal has the most vibrations and they like the vibrations. Somehow it makes them feel alive and they grow more. So anyway, we're working on a plant life balance playlist, which will of course go to a university, get a bit of science behind them, get them to look at these studies so we can release that to media as new news about the ultimate playlist to put on while you're not at home and get your plants to grow better. Because why wouldn't we? That gives us new news to the media back through the front door. Um, and we're looking at new apps in the future, like Alive and Thriving, where you can add your plant and then it'll uh, push notify you every time it needs to be watered, depending on where it is, what sort of plant it is, those sorts of things. So we find you constantly need to be evolving and finding new ways to involve you. But notice, at no point in this have I said to you, you should buy a plant. No point. Have we tried to sell you a thing? What we've offered you is interesting information, interesting ways, to, uh, serving suggestions, if you like, and interesting ways to play with your phone. So suddenly, just in that last bit, we've added YouTube, we've added Maps, we've added your eBay app, where you could buy the boxes, and we've added Spotify. Um, that's four more apps on your phone that we're getting our way into through this. When I added this up, I was slightly disappointed to realize that that doesn't look that nice on a screen. It seems to be missing one. Then I realized we had our own app, and there you go. That's a neat 12 apps we've managed to use, or 12 ways you use your phone that we've managed to enter your life in this campaign, as I say, without really serving you up a single ad. That is half a screen of your phone. There are six rows on your home screen if you have a, if you have a larger phone like I do. And therein lies my challenge to you. 
We're now looking at this as an approach to everything we do because we're going, basically, if we can think this way on every campaign, it's a much smarter way of marketing than trying to push you into things. It's using the world that you are already living in and it's bringing you things you want to find. I mean, honestly, it goes, the phone is not a device or a channel and you think of it like that, you think like an advertiser. Somebody said to me just this morning, uh, a very senior, very smart person said, advertising is me telling you how good I am. Publicity and word of mouth is other people telling you how good I am. And that's where you want to be in this world. And if you're thinking in an advertising world, you're thinking of phone as a channel. What I would encourage you to do is think of the phone as the middle of a lifestyle and try and support people in finding interesting stuff on there. How much time do you spend looking for something to find on your phone? We all do it because we're looking at that little endorphin rush. If you can find good, interesting stuff that people will go, oh, I like that, and follow it down the thread that you've created for them, eventually hoping to get them off the phone perhaps, as I say, get them into a nursery in this case, then I think you've found a far more interesting way of marketing to people and that's how I would um, suggest you put mobile at the middle of your marketing. Um, so my name is Ben, you can find me there. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, we might open for questions. How do you start with the original concept? So everything sort of spun out of that original concept. So what was your kind of process around kind of brainstorming to make something that exciting have the legs to go across all those apps? Yeah, sure. I mean, you need the strategic piece, which I don't show because it's kind of the, it's, mm. it's not very visual and everyone kind of does it, you know. You need to understand where's your market opportunity, what's happening in the market, why are people buying this, why are they not, who's our key audience, who are we going to talk to, those sorts of things. So we identified in there that the big opportunity was um, generally a female skew 25 to 35. It tended to be people who are into your yogas, into your health smoothies. We started, you start to come up with your headlines almost at that point and saying, you know, where's the, um, you're, you drink the green smoothie, but what about the green house, the green home? You know, where's the green in your amazing green life kind of thing? So you then start to identify who these people are, how are they living, what are they following, what are they reading? Follow those feeds, look through those sorts of things and, and understand that. And then I guess it becomes a case of once you know who your person is that you want to talk to, it's how do I, what if I was them? You know, I think there's an element of acting in all this, honestly. And I think when you think, how do I get you to do this? It's the worst way to think of marketing. It's, I am you, what would make me interested? Because otherwise, it's this idea that I can um, somehow change your behavior or hmm. like, you know, control you. And I just find that wrong, <laughs> to yeah. be honest, in so many ways. Whereas the idea of understanding you, it's the concept of empathy, I guess. Understand you, think, what would be useful in your life? What would you need to know? If, if I was you, what would I want in, in that life? Then suddenly things like um, that come out, because that's when I go, okay, I'm one of these people. Uh, and I literally sit down with clients, salespeople are some of my favorite people, because you go to them, uh, sell it to me. And you listen to how they sell it to you, because they've done this over and over again. Tell me, tell me this. And, and you have to ask, like people who grow plants, why, why are these good for my health and well-being? Tell me all about it. And that was, that was the moment we got the whole concept, was when I kept asking that question, as I said, and no one could answer it. Mm -hmm. I went, you can't answer that question, therefore no one knows the answer, therefore there's the opportunity to put that answer on the table. Fantastic, I love that, uh, that process. C can it work for pretty much any pro that process we've just gone through? So say we, we don't, a, a product that's maybe not as sexy, I don't know if our, um, I'm gonna use you as an example if you're in the room, our guys from New Zealand from uh, Bow Repairs. You guys, yeah, down, down the end here. So Bow Repairs, car tires. So <laughs> could you follow that kind of product association and think as long as you really know who your customer is, um, Look, I think that process I just outlined is the same for any marketing. Yep. If you're not in the mind and acting with empathy to your, your, your customer, then you're doing it wrong, yep. essentially. Yep. Um, can I then, I mean, plants are sort of sexy, I agree. At the same time, they're the most commodity product out there. Mm. So in some ways, you're branding up something that grows in the street. You know? So they come with their own challenges too. Uh, a tire is a different thing. It's more of a, I have to buy it than I want to buy it. But it's the same sort of thing happens. And you just need to go, OK, who buys the tire? What's the moment when they buy the tire? Um, what is going through their head? I suddenly need tires. What am I thinking? Therefore, what would make it easy and useful for me to uh, find out, A, when I need the tire and why, what's the benefits, and then which one do I choose? Because for most people, walking in and looking at tires is just confusion city. 
which is no different to plants, to be honest. I like that one. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, then, and then go, how can I use um, mobile technology to, to work your way through yeah, that? Yeah. It's a good way to do it because we were talking before actually about that in, in, in one of the breaks and we we're saying about, you know, there must be some education that you can do around this because it is. It's mm. like all the tyres look the same. They're all black and round. <laughs> but how do I know which one's which? Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, uh, down the end here. So Jonathan Adam from Tektronic Industries, Ben, that's a great presentation, by the way. Um, one thing I wanted to commend you on was, as marketers, a lot of the time we hear about the whole mobile-first approach, but this is actually the first time I've heard someone say we need to think campaign mobile-first approach as well. And it just mm. makes sense, right? I mean, everybody uses their mobile phone, we hear it all the time, but for campaigns, for some reason, we don't start at that as a very starting point. So mm. I thought that was really fantastic you pointed that out. That was a key takeaway for me. but. I had a, um, in regards to how you approached this campaign, from the very beginning, did you already have the idea that, you're gonna, that it was going to grow to that point? Um, and did you have a planned um, deployment approach for this? Or did you start with one initial idea of your new strategy and then assess how it performed and then it kind of just started growing from there? Uh, good question. Not a pun on growing trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of puns in yeah. this. Wait till you work on grass, then you turf wars. And, yeah, anyway. um, <laughs> the, um, the whole, everything I showed you there was planned out. So all the different activities, yes, most definitely were planned out. Um, because we had to create a user journey through, if that makes sense. And, and I, I need to get journey from you saw this to you bought this, and, and therefore you can't just plan a piece of that campaign. You have to plan the whole thing. Um, did we know it would go so well? No. I, when you, I was terrified launching this, honestly. And fear is a fantastic motivator. It really is, because when you, it's, it is new and it is different, and it wasn't done on that much money. That's well, including the development of the app, that's well under half a million bucks, which, given it's all over today shows and things, is a pretty amazing outcome. So, no, I was petrified, because you, you kind of go, you can drop, it, it's all so measurable. You drop an app into the world, no one downloads it, so the number's there for you to see, you know, and, and you've spent all this money on things. Uh, PR is a, uh, it's very uncontrollable news, but you can have an idea of what will, will sell and what won't when you've worked in it for a while, or what will fly and what won't. Um, but as I say, fear is a wonderful thing, and it really made us as a team go back and go, everything, have we thought of everything? And that's, that was what was taught to me way early in, in doing creative stuff is question everything. It's because the second, it's your assumption that trips you up. You know, so I went and read every blog I could find about how to launch an app, even though we'd done them before, and just went through. And then I sat with the team and went, look, have we thought through all these things? And there was one key thing that said most app, um, app discoveries are done on the app store, people browsing for apps. So therefore, your little screens might seem like, you know, your little screens that describe your app could feel like the end of the campaign. It was like, no, no, put them up the front. These are going to be super crucial. You know, so you really have to treat every piece of your campaign as, as hyper important. And, and then inevitably, some of it underperforms and some of it overperforms. But if you've put your effort into all of it, then that doesn't matter because something's going to work, you know? Mm. Mm. Excellent, great question. Um, do we have, yep, another question? Obviously, planning, uh, we've heard that a lot over the last two days, is you know, planning yeah. everything, doing that research, and then measuring as you go through. Yeah, um, I was interested because you're in so much in the mobile space. Um, a lot of talk is about that the store has basically lost his their attraction and that's moving towards progressive web apps. Hmm. How much do you see of that? Is it really already happening, or do you think actually it's just starting the trend and apps are definitely still valuable? Uh, that's a good question. We're, I'm not a an app specialist per se. We use it as part of our toolkit. Um, but my feeling is we always question making an app before we make one. They are fairly dev intensive, um, therefore costly. And I do agree with that. To me, there is a barrier to an app. I have to go and download it. I personally prefer to have something I can just access through my browser because, it's a, again, it's a simpler experience. I just go, what's the fastest experience? But having said that, when you've got something that's um, compelling for an app, like you can't do that through a web app at this point, then I think it's worth doing it. So I don't think there's one answer to that. I think apps will, from what I can see, have their place for a long time. But you have to really have a compelling reason for 
to make an app. I wouldn't just go make an app. We need an app. You know, that day, that day has definitely gone. Okay, uh, fantastic. So, folks, we've learned all we need to know. Well, there's probably more <laughs> to know. I'm sure we could go on talking all day because it was fantastic. But please thank our host there, Ben uh, Peacock, joining us.